four, three, two, one. MDS two, we have ignition, we have a liftoff. Well, program is in on time. Vehicle response is normal. Very smooth flight, very, very small attitude disturbances. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every young couple in love, every teacher of morals, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on the mode of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. Travel back in time to discover how events in our world's history suggest that we are not alone in the universe. And that our pale blue dot does have a purpose. Thousands of years ago, in an area now known as the Cradle of Civilization, an ambitious king had an encounter that would shape the world to come. Babylon was the greatest city on Earth, and its legacy still lives on. Passing through its imposing Ishtar Gate, travelers found a city teeming with life and full of gold and riches. This crowning jewel of antiquity was the envy of the world. Any visitor to Babylon um, at the height of its power would be absolutely staggered by the spectacle of its monumental architecture and by the fact that there gathered in the city were people from all over the world. It was a true metropolis. Babylon um, proclaimed itself to be the first city in the world. It was the city that the gods had first created. And this conceit reflected the fact that it was indeed a metropolis of an order and scale that the world had never seen before. One night, Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar was awoken by an unusual dream. A young Hebrew slave named Daniel was called to interpret the dream. Daniel, like many people in the ancient world, believed that dreams were significant. And God communicated, or gods communicated through dreams. And Daniel believed that his God, the God of the Hebrews, knew the meaning and the interpretation of this dream. In the king's dream, he saw a giant statue made of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, with feet of iron mixed with clay. Daniel revealed that each metal represented a mighty empire, beginning with Babylon as the head of gold. He accurately predicted the rise and fall of empires. But what evidence is there that Daniel wrote of events before they happened. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain sections of Daniel's writings and are dated to the second century BC. The Jewish historian Josephus tells of Daniel's writings being presented to Alexander the Great when he visited Jerusalem in the fourth century BC. And scholars note that the Aramaic used to write his book is a perfect match with the Aramaic of the sixth century BC. The first time I was exposed to this dream, I was admittedly skeptical. I mean, the idea that 
more than 2,000 years of human history is being told in advance by a dream of about 150 words is hard to believe. And I was confronted with the idea that either we're dealing with something that's a bit of a hoax or a put on, or something supernatural is in play. Daniel had predicted that an empire represented by the chest and arms of silver would rise to conquer Babylon. At the height of Babylonian dominance, Daniel foretold that an inferior kingdom will rise. and I live in Shiraz. It is one of the most beautiful cities of Iran, known for its gardens and poets. In my spare time, I love to take photos. As a Muslim woman, I feel in awe when I come to this mosque. Muslims, Jews, and Christians cherish Daniel as a sacred prophet. And over 2,000 years ago, a conqueror would rise from the east to lead a charge against the mighty empire of Babylon. For some years before the fall of Babylon, uh, the Babylonians knew that uh, the king of what they called Parsu, or Persia, a man named Cyrus, was conquering large parts of the world beyond their borders. After uniting with the neighboring Medes, Cyrus led his combined forces on a series of famous victories, firmly establishing his name as a star on the rise. But his rise would not be complete without the taking of Babylon. Herodotus portrays Cyrus as the very model of a great conqueror, and he portrays Babylon as Cyrus's greatest conquest, the supreme prize. And it's the supreme prize because it is the hardest nut to crack. Babylon was one mighty fortress. Its massive walls, deep moat, and imposing gates made it impossible for any invading force to conquer. Confronted by walls that could not be breached, Persian troops identified the river Euphrates as the point of entry. Diverting the river upstream, Cyrus's troops were able to march along the riverbed, under gates, and into the heart of the city. The walls of Babylon seemed impregnable to any invading force. And yet, in one of the great mysteries in history, the great city of Babylon fell in a single night into the hands of Cyrus. And it is only once Cyrus has taken Babylon that the king of Persia can worthily call himself the king of the world. Cyrus's conquests laid the foundation for the Medo-Persian Empire. Their large palace complexes can still be seen today. When I walk through the ruins of these ancient cities, I sense a strong connection with the past. I feel as though the legacy and messages of the past live on today. After conquering what seemed like the whole world, Cyrus died in battle. His tomb stands testimony to his enduring legacy. Today, Cyrus is still recognized as one of our country's greatest heroes. 
The empire he created was built on respect for others and a desire for lasting peace. I think that is something we all want. As the kings of Persia died, their bodies would be laid to rest here. Their elevated positions, a fitting symbol of their dominance and strength. But there is an unfinished tomb here. The last of the Persian kings was only just warming the throne when he would come face to face with an agent of Daniel's prophecy. A young and valiant general from the hills of Macedon had set his eyes on Persian destruction. The Medo-Persian Empire had conquered Babylon just as Daniel predicted. But Daniel's next prediction concerned the rise of a third empire, one of bronze, who would rule over the whole earth. The climbing here is like a tradition, passes from father to son. We have uh, easy routes and small rocks, and we have the, the big rocks. The highest top of the rocks is 250 meters. Fear is coming with climbing, and you enjoy climbing most when you fear. Before I climb, uh, usually take some breaths. It's quiet up there. You're uh, feeling the loneliness. Today, monasteries adorn the peaks of these sheer cliffs. In the 14th century, a lone monk named Verlam scaled these steep rock faces to construct a monastery. Under the watchful eye of a monk is a fresco depicting a key figure of Daniel's timeline, Alexander the Great. Alexander was born in the small state of Macedon. Upon becoming king at the age of 20, he proposed the unthinkable, to invade the mighty Persian Empire. Early victories filled Alexander with confidence, but it would be the dusty plain of Gorgomila where Alexander would risk it all. He invades Mesopotamia, Iraq, in the consciousness that by doing so, he will have the whole empire of the world in his hands if he wins. This is it. This is the absolute decisive battle because whoever wins this one is going to be either still the king of Persia or the new king of Persia. The Persian king had um, sent him a, a peace offer saying that, you know, you have the western half and 
leave me with the eastern half and we will have peace on those terms. And Alexander's right-hand man, a general called Parmenio, said that if I were you, I would accept these terms. To which Alexander said, yeah, and if I were you, I would accept them. But he's not, he's Alexander. It's impossible for him to accept terms. He has to push on, he has to go to the limits. In all of the battles he fought, really, he was just gonna go for it and just go for the jugular. The climax of his entire reign was approaching. Everything hung on it. Leading his forces towards the right flank, Alexander forced a gap to emerge in the Persian line. Persian chariots reacted by charging towards the Greek center. Alexander exploited the opening and pursued the retreating Persian king on horseback. Although heavily outnumbered on foreign soil, Alexander commanded a famous victory to bring about the downfall of one empire and the rise of another. The empire of silver was replaced by the empire of bronze, just as Daniel had said it would. There is a sense in which Alexander was a terrifying and blood-stained opponent, and we should absolutely not romanticize him. He killed a lot of people, and his greatness was raised amid the blood of a lot of people. Alexander would establish himself in Babylon at the former palace of King Nebuchadnezzar. But when reflecting on his conquests, he wept, for there were no more lands for him to conquer. Alexander was literally epoch-making. He marks the transition from one era to another. Without the genius of Alexander and without the military revolution that Philip, his father, had initiated, it's perfectly possible to imagine a world in which the Persian Empire continues. In many ways, I'd say perhaps that uh, as someone else has said before me, I think, that Alexander the Great was his own greatest creation. His Greek empire had conquered the then known world with astonishing speed. One man had fulfilled Daniel's prediction. Daniel predicted a fourth empire would rise to global power. Then there will be a fourth empire one strong like iron, just like iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. So it will break in pieces and crush the others. Located at the heart of the Mediterranean Sea is a city that grew from obscurity to become the center of a global empire. Rome, Caput Mundi, capital, of the world. Architectural wonders still stand, lasting symbols of strength and ambition. For over 20 years, Adriano Morabito has studied the foundations of the Roman Empire, hidden deep below ground. Many people come to Rome to visit what is above ground, but what lays underground is much more. Rome was a mega city of the past. The greatness of the Roman Empire is due to the network of roads that were made to conquer the different territories and by creating for every city a proper aqueduct. Aqueducts were built that thereby enabled the city to grow. And they also built roads, and the roads were built essentially if you like, as the kind of the threads of a net cast across conquered territory. I think it's one cliche that's often said that, that all roads lead to Rome, but I think it would be better to say that all roads lead from Rome. 
Roman roads took supplies and soldiers to the far reaches of the empire, bringing carnage and brutality wherever they went. When Western armies launch attacks, what they boast about is how few casualties they've inflicted. When Julius Caesar went to Gaul, he boasted about how many he'd slaughtered. But bloodshed wasn't restricted to foreign lands. Cheering spectators would gather in the Colosseum to watch as thousands were put to violent deaths. In many ways, the arena is the quintessentially Roman institution. This was an expression of their manliness, of their superiority over the barbarian world and over the natural world. At the height of the Roman Empire, nearly one in five people on the planet lived and died under the rule of the emperor. Its borders stretched from North Africa to Britannia. By 476 AD, barbarian invasions had reduced the Roman Empire's borders to a size not seen in six centuries. There were predators on the margins, uh, people called barbarians by the Romans. Many of them were dominated by the Romans and lost their freedoms to them, and obviously they resented and hated that. They were able to step in and take over vast chunks of what had been the Roman Empire. Daniel had predicted that the Roman Empire would crumble from within. As you saw the feet and toes, partly of clay and partly of iron, so the kingdom shall be divided, and partly strong and partly fragile. Barbarian tribes divided the Roman Empire and these new nations would lay the foundation for Europe to come. For Europeans, um, Rome is the ghost that will not go away. And almost the moment that um, the rule of the Caesars had collapsed, there were people who wanted to try and restore it. There's a sense in which you could argue that the Roman Empire never really fell and that we, as modern Europeans, are just latter-day Romans. Daniel's next prediction was that European kings and queens would seek to repair the divided empire through marriage alliances. As you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. As the 20th century approached, many of Europe's political powers were linked by marriage alliances, but family feuds would ignite events that would drag Europe through two world wars. Millions would perish as ambitious leaders sought to resurrect a united European empire. Determined to never allow Europe to descend into another bloody war, world leaders came together to sign peace treaties, paving the way for the development of the European Union. But the tension remains. Once open borders are being walled up, social and religious fears spill into the streets. Economic inequality, rising unemployment, and political extremism are gaining ground. It is clear. The iron and the clay aren't mixing. Daniel's dream contains seven predictive elements. That is, Babylon to Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia to Greece, Greece to Rome. And of those seven predictive elements, six have already come to pass. Now, just the sheer force of logic and of the odds would suggest that if six of the seven predictive elements have happened, that the seventh is very likely to happen as well. Daniel predicted that the gold of Babylon would pass into the hands of another. The empire of Cyrus, 
would come to an end. selfishness and greed of man's empires could never succeed. The strength and brutality of the Roman Empire would meet its match. Its borders fragmenting, divided from within, and efforts to unite against the word of God would continually fail. The final predictive element is that a stone cut out without hands, that's Daniel's way of saying a supernatural intervention, would strike the image on the feet of iron and clay. This would signify the end of all earthly kingdoms and that God would establish finally his own eternal kingdom. Today, our pale blue dot is positioned at the end of Daniel's timeline. He predicted that during the time of modern Europe, God would return to Earth to establish his eternal kingdom. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Daniel's prophecy binds together the hopes of humanity and reveals a God who has become part of our world. Daniel's final words to the king were that the dream was certain and its interpretation was sure. Our lives are often characterized by things that are not certain and not sure. We face the future with confusion and anxiety, but this whole narrative strongly suggests that human history and our own personal history is going somewhere, that in fact there is purpose and hope and even destiny. Millions ask if a God is out there watching our Earth spin into a meaningless future. But nowhere is the reality of God more apparent than in the writings of Daniel. His extraordinary revelation of the history of world empires defies reason and chance. It tells of God's hand guiding our world's history and a kingdom to come.